Today we're driving down the Highlands Highway from Mount Hagen to Garoka, along the most important arterial road in Papua New Guinea. The experience can be quite challenging sometimes, there's no doubt about that, since the condition of the road does not provide precisely an easy ride. Nevertheless, it remains a vital link for Papua New Guinea's export commodities. Roka is where all the PNG coffee passes through on its way down the highway. But it is also where much of the further downstream processing takes place, such as roasting and packaging for the domestic as well as the international markets. Many of these operations are managed by companies with long standing in PNG and are often family owned. Today we're meeting with Yuri Calway, who is an expert in identifying speciality coffees for international niche markets who appreciate the rare flavors of PNG beans. This is done through a process called cupping, very similar to wine testing, even though I would rather have a cup of coffee to drink instead of having to spit it out. All right, Steve, here we are. My goodness, I can smell the coffee. It's like a cafe at home. It smells good, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, this is where we check the quality of the coffee. That starts from green bean, but as you can smell, we also roast it and, and we taste it. The tasting process is, of course, uh, very interesting. I'd love to show you that. But it starts with the green bean. Okay, this is what the farmers bring to you. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, we only have green bean in this building. Every single bag of coffee you see is green bean. Well, yeah. I don't know, Yuri, it's pretty early in the morning. I wouldn't mind drinking a cup of coffee. You'll get quite a few. <laughs> so, Yuri, how do you decide on which beans are going to be good quality, which ones aren't? How do you make quality decisions? Good question. We just look at it. Mm -hmm. And I think the easiest way is just by showing you. Yes. Green bean, at first, may all look the same, right? So it looks pretty much the same to me. But if we then put them next to each other, for example, let me put two extremes next to each other. This is a beautiful uniform green bean, what I would call a high-end, high-quality coffee. You see a nice dark green, bluish coloration. Mm -hmm. No real, what we call defects. Uh, no broken beans, no Fairly different colors. Size. Exactly right. Yeah. And you'll be surprised how one of these, what we call a full sour, one of these beans in a cup of coffee made out of these beans can really make a difference between a good cup and a Spoiled not so good taste. cup. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick. So what we do here is clean it up, take these defects out. More importantly, I'd like to say cleaning up is the easy bit. The hard bit is to get the complexities of, a, of the flavors well defined and well captured. Because mm -hmm. an Australian roaster wants a different flavor profile compared to a United States roaster or a European roaster. And that's what we assess here. Let me call in uh, Susan, mm -hmm. who can prepare a cup for us. Susan, if you don't mind. So we prepared the same cup, so we're going to pour some water on it. And then you have a second opportunity to taste the coffee. Susan is managing the, uh, the quality lab. And I reckon one of the best cuppers in, in the country, one so of the best coffee tasters. she's a professional tasters. at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, this comes with experience. Mm -hmm. The longer you do it, the, the more you pick up the differences between a coffee from the Eastern Highlands versus the Western Highlands, from supplier A versus supplier B. And it, so environmental issues and like soil, the climate, the way that it's roasted, they all impact on the final flavor? Of they the, all the definitely do. You, you can imagine that a dark soil um, gives a different flavor to the coffee than uh, limestone soil in, in, in Chihuahua, for example. Mm -hmm. And we've got to cherish that. So you, you break the crust and you let... And that releases... Let your nose do the work. Yeah, smell it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, have a go. Let me rotate the table a bit. And really smell it. Let it... And it's supposed to be a messy process. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, this is, um, I do pick up a little bit more from that. That's, um, yeah. you can see, as you say, it's, it is a messy process. We can tell you're not an experienced scupper, but, but you get the idea, yes, I right? I noticed Susan yeah. didn't spill one single drop. D did you get anything uh, special out of that cup? So you take a spoonful, careful, it can be still hot, and slurp it in with a lot of air and a lot of noise, and f uh, don't be embarrassed about it, that's a trick. Oh, you sound like you've done this before. Done it before. Yeah. 
No, I can't slurp as well as you. Well, at this point, it's clear that I'm making a bit of a mess of this whole experience, which goes to show the complexities of cupping. This procedure is obviously best left to the real professionals like Yuri to get right. So, so where in the world do you market these speciality coffees? You name it. I think that's the beauty of P&G. It's, it's got such a fantastic potential. We would sell our specialty coffees literally all over the world. The European markets to, to the United States, uh, larger, a large portion of our coffees go to the US. The Australian market is very important. The number of specialty roasters and micro roasters in, in Australia is, is impressive. And they all hunt for that special cup. But you actually have people who come here and do this cupping from overseas. They fly yeah. in. I mean, I've just flown in from Kokopo, but you get people from all over the world. Is that correct? Yeah. What we did is the, the, the short and messy version of it. Yeah, yeah I'm, we the have, <laughs> I'm the messy one. We have, um, you can imagine, we have uh, people flying from overseas. We have tables and tables full of, of, of different types of coffee. So the whole morning we would go around tasting different coffees. Uh, the bench behind me as well would be full of different uh, lots of coffee, uh, stock lots, what we have in our warehouse. And uh, one roaster may identify these 16 bags that were supplied by one of our suppliers as his favorite coffee. And he would buy that 16 bags. He would market so that 16 So you come all bags. the way from the US to buy a specialty coffee that's 16 bags? Absolutely. Of course, we, we do hundreds of these a day, so we don't drink it, we spit it out. Um, oh, otherwise, you're supposed to drink it. Yeah, you, you won't sleep for a week if you drink it all. So what do, you, what do you pick up? Do you pick anything up other than nutty and chocolate, what you just mentioned? There's a variety of flavors to choose from here. Maybe something a bit uh, citrusy. I wouldn't know where be sort of lemon or... I'm of, already some, impressed, yeah, exactly. With something exactly, something yeah. a little bit, um, yeah. You've got some citrus peel, some oranginess, mm -hmm. uh, orangey notes in there. Um, um, I know what coffee it is, I cheat it, but you could even pick up a little bit of um, the florals. Uh, one of the favorites in, in this cupping room is called um, a sense of hibiscus in there. And it makes it a really exceptional coffee in my view. It is extremely difficult to distinguish the peculiarities of the different flavors when we're overwhelmed by the heady aromas of so much coffee. So you can see that coffee is not quite as simple as people think it is. It's actually an incredibly complex process. It starts with the grower, who as soon as he's harvested that coffee cherry, there are issues from there on in terms of processing, and then the manufacturing side of it, the roasting, and the way that it's presented on the marketplace. The other issue is that the diversity of Papua New Guinea's landscape, the different soils that are available, the different waters that are used in processing from rivers, whether they be muddy or pristine, all make a difference to the end flavour of those cups of coffee that we've tried today. Walking down this bush track with Kelly Inai, the founder of Mountain Honey, who has been involved in the industry for many years now, and he has promoted honey production as an appropriate rural-based industry with great potential for future growth, considering that the majority of honey consumed in Papua New Guinea is still imported from Australia. Hey Kelly, I'm, I'm, we're standing in the middle of all these bees, what's going on? Why am I not getting stung? Yes, you are not getting stunned. As the saying goes, the busy bees are very busy with the activities of collecting nectar, coming into their boxes, and those nectars are, are kept in here, then it turns into a honey. So they are very busy working their ways in and out to get the, the nectar in. And at the same time, they won't be stinging you because the sting only comes when you hit the bees or you chase them or you wave strangely in front of them. They will start singing you that your accent and they start uh, stinging you. Well, that's, I didn't know that about bees, so I've learned something new already today. Okay, now what we'll do is I'll, I'll have to light my smoker, and this is the normal process of how we go through opening the box to work with the bees. This smoker is uh, a best friend to us, the bee farmers. What normally we do, we get coconut husk, put the coconut husk right inside this, and we produce smoke, 
and we go and work with our bees. The smoker, what it does in the box is there's two things that it does. One, it disorientates the bees from communication. And the, sec right. the mm -hmm. second thing it does is it gives them that instinct. So they start getting a lot of honey and they're ready to take off. If mm -hmm. there is a fire, then they can easily so it's, fly it's off. it's sort of like a defence mechanism for it, the bee. It, it is. Yeah. And that, that really helps us, the farmer. So okay. uh, every time we go to open the box, use the smoker. Okay, it's very interesting because bees are actually social animals. People tend to think of insects as being solitary and very ancient and primordial almost. But in reality, they have a very intricate social structure. Part of what the smoking is doing is disrupting that pattern of social behavior. And it's also <laughs> scaring them because they think there's a fire nearby, which means they've already gone into a defensive flight or fight mode, which is when they can either sting you or they can take off with the honey that they've already consumed. Okay, so Kelly, what are we getting in here? Well, we're coming here to get this uh, veil and we'll be using this veil to protect our face to go into the bee box. Okay, let's get this one down and then- You still got your cap on. Yeah, I have my cap on. I'll show you how, how it works here. And I think you need a cap as well. Do if I need you a are, cap as well? Yeah, you, you, you need a cap. So what we do is you just open the end here. You can pull yours down. I'll show you. And then look at the back here. That's the back with the, with the attachment. There you go. That's the back. Okay. And then and at the front side. So you put right through and then you have this hat on your head to put the straps okay, around here. All at the top. That's yeah, right. right. Uh -huh. And then and then you see this one here, it pokes the, the, uh, the veil out. Keep so the bees, it, it keeps the bees out from not stinging okay, your so face. Okay, keeping the veil away from your face. That's right. Okay. And then you, you put the rope around your waist and then you give a tie like this. And off we go, we are ready to go into the bee box. Okay. <laughs> well, I probably look a bit like my grandma used to do, but um, at least with this on, I feel a little bit protected. Come on then, Kelly, let's go and get close up to these bees. The usage of pesticides, unfortunately, has had a negative impact on apiculture around the world. But that's not the case with Kelly, who runs a pretty tight operation, very much family owned, where he can showcase his many abilities, including manufacturing his own tools. In a word, he is the essence of a homemade PNG entrepreneur. So these are the actual honeycombs inside here? That's right, these are honeycombs. All right. And these are the frames, and that's the bee. You can help me with the smoke? Okay, yeah, you, you puff? Some yes, puff some more. So you see, when you're puffing, you see, the bees are going down. You, you puff at these bees, they'll start going away. Because the smoke is making them to go. So they're going back down into back the Back down, yeah, into the to hive. collect honey, or? Yeah, they collect honey, and they are down there, and they won't be coming they're out to sting you. Queen. Yes. Mm. Okay, then you can stop. You hear the noise? That means there's a lot of smoke that goes in there. So you just pull this one at the far end and then put this one on the side like this. So if there is a bee in there or the queen bee, it falls down and comes back into the uh, box. Okay, and then you up and then look inside to see. You see? How do you distinguish the queen bee from the rest of the bees? The queen bee is a bit bigger than this bee and it got short wings, so I'll show you as we go through. Okay. We, we don't see the queen here. But you see the bees are now putting their heads inside to collect nectar because they've smelled the, smelled the smoke, so it's a way for them to go out now. You see all of them are ducking in here? Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. You can play with the bees like this, you want a bee sting? Right. Mm -hmm. So they won't even sting like that? No, they, you just play around with them and then if you get a sting, well, that's just one sting. <laughs> Trying to avoid getting any. Yeah, you see, Steve, these are, the, these are the broods that hatch out. So they lay their eggs in the in, honeycomb? That's right. And that's the grub stage of the bee? The bee, yes. And then they come out from here to be adult bee like this, and they go. So now I'm looking around. I saw the queen. You see, can you spot the queen in here? Right there, right there. Yeah. There you go. Doesn't have the stripes? No. Which is the other bees? No, that's that's the queen. This is the one that lays 700,000 egg per annum. There you go. There's that's only the one. one. Bee. Yeah. She looks after all the others. All the, yes, she got. They all do what she wants. She has the pheromone in her body that produces to calm the, que the bees. If the bee goes over 100,000 bees in there, they start to create their own queen. Hmm. Yeah. So this is. Then they go somewhere else. Then they fly out as a swarm and then they have their own colony. Okay, in the actual honey, 
the honey is, I don't see honey here. It could be, we'll have honey in this frame here. I think the second box. We have three types of bee in the box. We have male bee, which is called drone. The female bee is the queen. And, and the, third, the second female is this bee here, we call it weka bee. And about 60,000 of them are weka bee who goes out to forge for nectar. And these are the ones they get honey in, in the box. So, so why do they produce honey in the first place? The honey bee produce honey for their own food. That's for them to use. Right. But then us human beings are now coming, becoming a robot who is getting the honey out and then we're using it for our gain. But they have excessive honey and they said, okay, when we have a bad time, we'll, we'll use the honey. So that's, that's their food. Basically, it's the bee's food. It's kept so for them. So we learned to farm a wild animal by, um, and benefit from it. Exactly, exactly. Otherwise, and other animals do as well. Bee, I don't know, bears eat yeah. honey and there are birds in Africa that eat honey. Honey, yes, yes. They go and steal it from them too. Yes. <laughs> <Very>. <laughs> Not only do these amazing insects produce honey, but they also assist in pollinating many crops. And here in the highlands, they have an important role in pollinating coffee trees, which, as we know, is the mainstay of the highlands economy. Therefore, farmers are very much in favor of the proliferation wow. of this little busy bee. So Kelly, you've obviously been um, involved in the beekeeping industry for quite some time. When did you start? Yeah, actually, <clears throat> Right here where we are, I started in 2006, but uh, the honeybee thing is, I'm passionate about it. I was a kid in 1976, and uh, we have a missionary who brought in the honey in the country, and I thought this is, uh, this is something we'll be working on it. So since then, I've been very interested in honeybee uh, bee projects. So. so it's clearly changed from a hobby to being a business. Exactly. It's, it's changing. It, mm -hmm. it, at first it was like hobby, collecting books, writing books, working with the bees. And then eventually I see there's a great potential in there. So uh, it becomes a business now. Uh, yeah, honey, honey tea. Honey tea. Yeah. Wow. Look nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So this is your honey with a label on it. That's right. That's my honey with the label there. Magnificent. A product of PNG. That's right, and we call it mountain honey. With Kelly's effective guidance today, we've learned about the intricacies of apiculture, and also a little about the astonishing relationship that humans have formed with an insect. This ability to coexist has been going on for thousands of years, and whilst most insects are regarded as pests, the bee has a sophisticated social life and can produce this amazing product we know as honey, a food source for the benefit of all mankind. Today, we will be looking at the Ayura Aquaculture Development Centre, mainly used as a breeding centre for carp and super tilapia, two species which can coexist and seem to thrive in the highlands environment. Aquaculture is an industry that started and stopped several times in Papua New Guinea, as the first trials and experimentations go back to 1954 when freshwater fish such as carp and tilapia were first introduced into Papua New Guinea. Micah here is a fisheries biologist and he's going to show us a couple of these super tilapia which are an amazing fish. So he's not flapping around, why is that? Uh, it's because you have your uh, hands covered around the eyes so it can... Okay, that stops him jumping and flapping, yes. all right. So this little fish can actually grow up to five kilos, which is quite a large fish. So, Micah, why did you select this particular species of fish? You have two here, I believe, the carp and this uh, super, super tilapia. Super tilapia, we selected or promoted this fish because it's a hardy fish uh, which can survive or thrive in uh, harsh conditions like uh, PNG, where they can feed on any uh, feed that's in the pond. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, they can tolerate a wide range of temperature range in the pond. If the uh, water is very cold or hot, they can thrive in that. So uh, they are suitable, more suitable for pin. So they're very adaptable. Adaptable. Fish. This fish, uh, they originated from the Philippines. It was brought to PNG in 1999 and was quarantined for about two years and was uh, distributed in 2001. Okay, and you have approximately how many farmers around the country? We have more than 20,000 farmers. Uh, those are the ones that have been recorded, but we have many farms. Many more. Many more yeah. farmers. In so here you have um, carp and these super tilapia, as you call them. Yes. Um, what's the difference between the two? The difference between the carp and the super tilapia is that the uh, carp, they bottom feeders. They live at the bottom of the pond. And the super, they are the surface feeders. And the breeding characteristics are different. Completely different. Di different. Okay, with the uh, carp, they lay their eggs on substrates or... Uh, on the weeds. And on the weeds and in, in the pond. And um, the super tilapia, they fertilize the eggs. Uh, and they incubate it in their mouth. And they carry the eggs round in the mouth Until for they, how long? For about 21 days. For weeks. 21 days. And then when they hatch out, uh, uh, they're still <laughs> in the mouth for some time until they're really grown up to defend themselves so they uh, they can... So the fish, the, the little small fry, yes, they can swim out and come back inside the mother's well, mouth? The, during the first stage, they swim around just around the mother. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and when they see some other bigger fish coming towards them, they swim back into the mouth of the mother too. So they're very good parents, in other words. They look after their young. So the reason that these fish were brought into Papua New Guinea is that they're very compatible with other agricultural practices that happen around PNG. And one of the issues nutritionally is that most of the highlands crops are fairly low in protein. So it's very difficult for people in remote areas of the highlands to get adequate protein intake, especially important for young children. So I'll put this little fella back in the water, keep him cool, and we'll go and see some of the fish in the pond. This is the end of our journey through Eastern Highlands, a region of many faces related to the agricultural industry. But it is also a part of the country to experience the unique culture and traditions which have shaped this part of Papua New Guinea, where it is still possible to step into a village and experience a spontaneous display of culture through an improvised sing sing. Stay tuned for the next episode of Farming PNG in the port city of Leh on Thursday the 27th of April at 7pm on this network.